The following program originally appeared on Tor.com and is being resyndicated here by io9. To the Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Hosted by John Joseph Adams and David Barr Kirtley. Hi, this is Dave. And this is John. And welcome to Episode 7 of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Uh, today we'll be talking to Steve Ely, the creator and host of the Escape Pod science fiction short story podcast. It's the uh, most popular podcast of its kind. And we'll be talking to Steve about how Escape Pod got started and what kind of stories he looks for and where he sees the whole podcasting scene going in the in the years to come. I have a feeling Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is going to be a big part of uh, big part of that, but uh, <laughs> definitely. But we'll 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 see about that. That's assuming we make it to episode eight. <laughs> but and then uh, stick around after the interview, where John and I will be talking about some of our favorite Escape Pod episodes and just about uh, audio fiction in general. Um, but so now let's get to our interview. All right, let's get Steve on the phone. Hello, hello. Uh, hi, it's Dave and John from Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Yes. How are you? Good. Uh, thanks. Thanks for joining us. Okay. So first of all, uh, could you just tell us a little bit about how Escape Pod got started? Like, what prompted you to start the podcast, and uh, how did the launch come together? Um, I think I first heard about podcasting somewhere around the end of 2004, maybe the very beginning of 2005. And I think it's a lot like blogging. People just hear the term, and there's a small percentage of people that just, something clicks in their heads, and they say, man, I've got to try one of those things. About that time, I was listening to uh, Mike Lenevo's Dragon Page podcast, and I knew that a couple of folks were already starting to podcast novels that they'd written. Uh, T. Morris and Scott Sigler were the first two to do that, I believe. And it kind of clicked in my head that I had a long, long while ago thought of starting up a webzine, just like I think half the writers in the world want to start up a webzine at some point, or another science fiction writers at least. And no one was doing short fiction podcasting at the time. Novels were happening, but nobody was doing short stories. I know I like to read things out loud. So it just sort of fell into place as an experiment at that time. And the hard part was convincing my wife that I wasn't insane. Hmm. Uh, and I, did, I remember that succeed? conversation. <laughs> <laughs> For that particular reason, yes. She she has other good valid reasons <laughs> to insane. But uh, I remember the conversation very clearly in the kitchen. And I said, yes, I thought of a good podcast idea. I'm going to do short stories. She said, where are you going to get the short stories? I said, uh, we'll ask writers for them. And why will they send you stories? Um, because we'll pay them. <laughs> and I was just expecting her to wince at that. And she's like, where are you going to get the money from? We'll, uh, I don't know, ask for it. <laughs> and and that was basically the, the the initial notion behind the experiment was as that's why we launched at paying twenty dollars per story for audio reprint rights. I figured that yeah, even for webzine rates, twenty dollars is was probably moderate semi pro rate. And it's about what I was spending at on PlayStation games at the time anyway. So which I don't have time to play anymore. But uh, yeah, let's kind of throw away money for a couple of months, and we could start asking for donations from the from whatever listeners we got in the first couple of months. And if people started to pony up with that and, and, and started to have an interest in supporting the podcast, then wonderful, it could go on. If it didn't, then you know, two or three months, it's it was an interesting experiment. I wouldn't begrudge, um, you know, that, that kind of expenditure. And we could just say, okay, it was fun. Uh, as it turned out, we started to break even in our second month. When you're just paying 20 bucks, it doesn't take a lot of people to drop $5 on you in order to make that happen. And it's been growing pretty steadily since then. And at this point, we're paying $100 for audio, for non-exclusive audio rights for, for story. So it's kind of developed into a business, an actual business. We incorporated in, it's Nest Corporation in 2006. And we have a lot more people 
staffing the the thing now um and i'm I'm still way too slowly making efforts to reincorporate it as a five hundred one c three nonprofit so I can't say that it's all Steve's fault <laughs> uh so your motto is have fun um and as I understand it, one of your motivations for starting escape pod was that you didn't think there was enough emphasis being put on fun in short fiction. From a lot of the reading I was doing, because I was subscribed to several of the magazines, and I was seeing a lot of what was out there, and I I had started to have the gnawing sense that a lot of the markets, while, I mean, certainly they they took themselves seriously, took the genre very seriously, and, and, and they were generating a lot of very valid respect for the medium, weren't necessarily trying to capture younger audiences, they weren't trying to grow audience, and they weren't trying to put things out that were appealing to people who weren't already deeply invested in the genre. I was seeing a lot of highly literary stories. I was seeing a lot of stories that sort of assumed that you had this built-in knowledge of what was going on you know, across decades of, of the form. And that's not how I remember science fiction when I was young. Granted, those things were probably all going on, and I wasn't noticing or remembering them. But yeah, how many of us who are scientists or engineers or computer scientists now were doing it because of the science fiction we read as a kid? And I felt like the stuff I was reading now wasn't capturing that same sensibility. It wasn't exciting the imagination quite as much. Or if they were out there, they were harder to get to and harder to find. It's it's harder and harder just to to spot magazines in the bookstores nowadays. You really have to be invested just to find the fiction. Uh, Even on the internet, you have to know where to search for it. So I felt that the very least I could do was to try to put something that would be really easy for people to get to and really easy for people to consume the stories. Because reading, you know, I, I mean, obviously I'm a huge reader. Well, I'm sure most of our audience either are huge readers or we hope will become huge readers. That's that's my favorite fan mail is when people say, yeah, I wasn't reading Asimov's, now I'm subscribed because of these writers that you were putting on, et cetera. But uh, reading has a lot of competition for time. You have the internet, there's games, there's everything. There's a lot of time when your eyes and your hands may be busy, but your ears aren't. Everyone has to commute these days uh, on the, in the car or on the train. Every, you know, you're mowing the lawn, you're at the gym. And if we can just get a chunk of that time to get people interested in excellent writers like David Barker, uh, yeah, and, and get people to, to realize what's out there, then hopefully from us, they start seeking out more of it. So prior to doing Escape Pod, uh, I mean, you mentioned that you liked reading stories as loud, but uh, did you have any kind of background in recording or performing? Uh, not to speak of, not, I mean, a, a, apart from bad college theater, uh, <laughs> uh, not, nothing, certainly nothing I would brag about. Uh, it, it was all personal stuff. I, my wife and I, one of our bedtime rituals was I would read to her in bed. We we made it through most of the Harry Potter series that way. Um, and so I had a lot of practice at it. Uh, practice in front of people was a somewhat different story, but the nice thing about a podcast is that you get to edit it. So no one knows how bad I actually am at this as long as I work hard enough. (laughs) Come to think of it, that's true of writing, too. So tell us more about your bedtime rituals. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) Um, (laughs) I think that's a different podcast. (laughs) Uh, uh, No, so, um, okay. So how do you pair up narrators with stories? The first question is, is this story so cool that I've just got to read it myself? <laughs> there, there have been a few of those. And, uh, you know, I, I, I love reading these things out loud. And so one of the reasons why I, I like doing this is because I get a chance to do it when I feel I'm the appropriate voice or, you know, just as long as I'm, I'm not totally the wrong voice, I'll, I'll do it if I feel like it some of the time. Beyond that, I think the story does suggest itself to particular readers a lot of the time. I tend in that sense to have my mental Rolodex of who has a good voice, who sounds relatively articulate, who has good sound quality on their podcast. The vast majority of our narrators are podcasters, um, just because from a technical standpoint, that makes it really easy. I know they've already got equipment, and I can scope them out without them having to submit an audition to us. I can just go listen to their podcast and determine if they record everything next to their fish tank and yeah with with the air conditioner running full blast on a five dollar logitech mic beyond that it's just a matter of reading the story out loud in my own head 
and trying to think, okay, who do I know has this kind of voice? Sometimes it's harder than other times. Uh, we're doing, we're trying to do more international stories. We're trying to do more stories with an ethnic flavor to them, and it can be fairly difficult sometimes to find good readers who can handle those stories well. We've been fairly lucky in that as we've become known, we've had more actual voice actors you know, submitting to us and saying they would like to do it because they realize that. Yeah, that's a good way to get their own name out and uh, you know, to sort of build their own reputations. Everybody wants to build up a portfolio of this stuff. Um, plus, it's fun to do. If someone is listening to this now and they want to become a, a voice actor for you, should they get in touch with you? or? Yeah, just drop me an email, editorescapepod.org. Yeah, also, um, Ben and uh, yeah, now Dave and Anna at, at Podcastle, you know, editor at pseudopod.org, editor at podcastle.org. Yeah, you know, any of those, and we we do conspire and we collaborate on these things. And the first thing we'll we'll ask is where can we listen to something that you've done? So it it needn't be a podcast. That is one of the easy ways to do it. But uh, essentially, we just we we need to know what you sound like so that we can match the stuff up. Are there any stories that you just really really love and you'd like to run on Escape Pod, but you just can't see them being adapted to audio properly? Yes, and, and those are some of my most heartbreaking moments because there there are a lot of stories that I personally love, but for whatever reason, you know, when, when you start to think about what are the needs of audio, you don't adapt well. You know, our, our 200th episode, you know, I've <laughs> sort of begun to establish a tradition that every 100 episodes or so, we'll pick one of the classics. And the first one we did was Nightfall by Asimov, which was great for it. The second one, I actually wanted to do The Cold Equations. Uh, mm. by Tom Godwin. I had in my head for months that I was going to track down whoever the agent was for Godwin's estate, figure out how to get the rights to that and run it. Then I read the story again, and I realized that although it certainly is a very provocative and, and, and stimulating story, it just wasn't structured well for audio at all because it's all this very heavy, omniscient viewpoint. It, it, was, it was very pedantic. Really, mm. and it just it it just wasn't paced as the action story that I remembered it being from my golden age of thirteen. So that's why we did the Heinlein instead. We did all you zombies because, well, <laughs> whether or not it's typical Heinlein, it was fun, <laughs> and yeah, that that went that went over very well with people. Yeah, th there there are a lot of stories, and and there are so many writers these days who do beautiful prose, but beautiful prose alone doesn't make for good audio because the listener can't just stop and rewind. A reader can stop and reread a paragraph a couple of times and, and let it sink in, let, let that absorb. Uh, a listener can't easily. You have to pause. You have to go back 30 seconds. You have to listen to it again. You know, listening is much more of a constant stream uh, of, of narrative. And so there has to be a strong narrative sense to the story in order for that to really work. Uh, things have to happen. Is, is how I always simplify it down. Uh, strong dialogue makes for a really good story for audio adaptation as well. And, and there are authors who manage both, who do beautiful prose and also have strong action and compelling character and plot in their stories. Tim Bratt's an excellent example. We've run a lot of Tim Bratt stories because they, they are wonderfully written and they're fun. Okay, so if, if someone's never listened to Escape Pod before and they want to give it a try, can you think of a few episodes in particular that would make a good introduction to the show? Sure. One of the, uh, one of the ones that people keep bringing up as a favorite was Connie Maybe, uh, which was somewhere in our first 50 or so episodes. And, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it, was, it was read by Wichita Rutherford, yeah, who does a bluegrass interview podcast. <laughs> and whether or not you like bluegrass, his podcast is hilarious. And he did he he did a fantastic, funny, cantankerous old man uh, for for that story. One of my personal recent favorites is the Mister Penumbra's Twenty Four Hour Bookstore, which we did just a couple of months ago. That was by Robin Sloan. And although it's technically it's only very in the borderline of science fiction. It's really much more of a fantasy piece, but it's, it happened to be a fantasy piece about data visualization with characters from Google in it. So I decided it was an escape pod story, damn it. 
the, those hundredth episodes, um, I, I personally believe that everyone should listen to Nightfall or should read Nightfall at some point in their lives. Well, one of the reasons why I did it, one of the cases I made to, uh, you know, that, that Asimov estate agent was that there are too many people in the current generation who aren't familiar with these kinds of with, with these stories. And Nightfall was voted in the '60s by Tsefla as being the best science fiction story of all time. I still think it stands way up there. Uh, so Escape Pod seems to have uh, one of the most active message boards online for discussing new short fiction. Uh, what kind of feedback have you gotten from listeners over the years? That, that's one of the things I love about new media in particular is that if you give people a chance to bring it into a conversation, people will create a conversation on this stuff. And so, yeah, we got a lot of feedback. Uh, sometimes it's a wonderful thing. Sometimes not so much. We've had authors who have – you know, sort of run away from our forums crushed at, at some of the excessively honest feedback. And um, unfortunately, it's a pattern in the internet also. Some people will be jerks just for the sake of being jerks. And so we, we actually used to have blog comments. We shut down blog comments because we found that it was really too easy for people to do drive-bys and just slam a story or slam the reader or slam the author on a personal basis without really adding to constructive critical discussion of the story. The forums tend to be a bit more reinforcing of civility, at least. People still have very strong opinions, and we never try and shut down a comment just because they're critical of a story. As soon as you do that, you're essentially not discussing a, a story. You are, well, <laughs> I, the, the word may not be suitable for a family podcast. But uh, I don't know if this is a family podcast. <laughs> 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 We're not going to go back to the bedtime rituals again. <laughs> um, no, so it's, it's it's not a question of whether the opinion's positive or negative, but we do have strong rules that you can you can attack a story, you can't attack the people. You can't say anything personal about the author, you know, or personal about the narrator. Yeah, you know, and and yeah, you know, some people have found that the heat in our forums gets to be a bit too much for them. We we're trying to do a bit better these days, and we have some excellent moderators who are very even-handed, and at least in, from my perspective, they're they're fairly even-handed, and they do a really good job of splitting out topics if things get too far off into politics or something, and uh, so that the the story discussion threads remain about story. And yeah, we've had a very active, you know, we have thousands of people just on the forums alone. Which, when you consider that it's generally only a small percentage of people who will be inclined to be so engaged they want to join a discussion, then yeah, you know, to to me that's a fairly big success metric. How how many listeners do you estimate that you have overall? Uh, from our download counts per episode, right now we're floating in the range of twenty four to twenty five thousand per episode. Um, that's if you if you look at the downloads after the first two or three weeks. Okay, so you've also uh, organized meetup events for Escape Pod listeners at various conferences and conventions over the years. Mm -hmm. Sure, yeah, it's, it's never been on any really organized basis. Unfortunately, we we haven't had the the budget to do really systematic, you know, hitting cons or making sure that we have a table at WorldCon, that sort of thing. I'd, I'd love to, yeah, I'll grow to that point one of these days. Uh, as it is, it's just whenever one of us. You know, myself or Ben, or you know, if we happen to be at a convention, you know, we try to make sure people know about it, and uh, at least get together for beers and such. Uh, the closest we've done to anything organized uh, for the past three years, a Dragon Con, which is the big convention here in the southeast. Um, you know, cutting minks of the Polyamory Weekly podcast. Um, you know, ex girlfriend of mine and I, we we kind of get our combined podcast audiences together, and we have a brunch Sundays at Dragon Con. We have about forty, fifty people show up to that. That's been a lot of fun. Okay, so at first, Escape Pod published uh, science fiction, fantasy, and horror, but it eventually grew large enough that you spun off the fantasy and horror genres into their own podcast, uh, making Escape Pod basically focus on science fiction. So what prompted you to separate the genres into their own podcast? With, with Pseudopod, it began for me with sort of a feeling that, although I was personally a horror fan, horror wasn't somewhat where I was trying to go with the feel of Escape Pod. My, my sense was that people were listening to this on their Monday morning commutes. We didn't want to throw anything that would be so visceral. <laughs> it would kind of ruin your work day, like what you got out of the car. <laughs> um, although some people do crave that experience. 
and I, I felt that horror was enough of a love it or hate it sort of thing that splitting it out made sense. And uh, yeah, Ben Phillips, who's the editor of it, was a longtime friend of mine. Um, yeah, we used to be in the same writing group together. And Mur Lafferty was a very experienced podcaster who had spoken to me about a similar idea. So at BookCon one year, I got the two of them together, and you know, over a couple of beers, the whole thing got hashed out. And it's been such a such a great success just in terms of the quality of what they've been doing. Uh, ben didn't like to be behind the microphone so much, so they got Alistair Stewart, um, you know, wonderfully dry British guy, to to do the hosting. And yeah, I I'm jealous of Al's intros and outros. I think he's he's much better than I am <laughs> at, at bringing the message of the story home. So yeah, that's been great with with podcasts. So it was less because I felt like fantasy wasn't fitting on Escape Pond. And so I kind of got a little bit tired of people bitching about it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, there, there were so many folks who said, yeah, I love your science fiction. I want more science fiction, less fantasy, please. Or, And yeah, I uh, would like to get people what they want. And we had grown to the point where we had the budget for it. And I felt that, okay, yeah, it's, it's more opportunity for people. It's more content going out in a week if we have both a fantasy podcast and a science fiction podcast. So, yeah, we just, it took a while to get all of the pieces to slot into, spa- into place. And it was really much more Rachel Swirsky's energy that made that happen than it was my own energy. She basically took charge of it. Uh, once I, she was fantastic, you know, post her on the forums. And so I just sort of tapped her on the shoulder and said, hey, yeah, you're smart. Are you interested? Mm-hmm. And yeah, she yeah, was, was happy to do it. And uh, so really where podcast lives right now is largely thanks to her and to Anne Lecky, you know, who, who assisted her in that. Are there any so, other kind of changes um, that you foresee in the future for the podcast? The big thing is just trying to take Escape Artists, the company, um, nonprofit. Um, you know, we've, we've kicked around ideas from time to time of, of other podcasts that we would like to do. You know, we've talked about an adult fiction podcast. We've talked about a young adult podcast. So they've got both ends of that spectrum. And it's not so much that we couldn't do them as just we want to stay focused on making sure that we have the human resources and, and the human energy uh, to make the stuff that we've got now working and organized and that nobody's getting too loaded down with trying to administrate all this stuff. Um, you know, everybody who does this essentially does it on a volunteer basis. Um, you know, the editors and some of the, you know, some of the folks get paid a little bit for what they do, but it's, for the most part, it's really, really driven by volunteers. All of our narrators are volunteers. Some of our audio editors are volunteers. And, and certainly nobody's doing it for the money. <laughs> um so we, we try to make sure that it, it doesn't become more not fun than fun for anybody involved. Well, you know, speaking of young adult fiction, are there a lot of kids that listen to the podcast? And if people have kids, um, are there episodes that you would recommend that they try out on them? Yeah. yeah. I'm, always, I'm always surprised because every time we do a story that really is suitable for younger audiences, we get huge positive response. So some of the fan favorites have been a series called Squonk the Dragon, which was uh, by a writer named Pete Butler. And yeah, it's just it's a fantasy series about a, a dragon who was raised by a bluebird and thinks he's a bird and wants to become a wizard. <laughs> and yeah, we've done two of them and I've got rewrites with, with Pete in process for the third one. We've done some really good young adult stories from Janie Lee Simner. It's pretty straightforward to find because we have links on our site for the ratings. We we try to do some sort of semi-accurate rating of each story with just using the motion picture guidelines G and PG and R, and we have a few X stories. And yeah, we, we don't try and limit our block fees in any way. We just assume that parents will now be paying the attention that parents should be, and and exercise their own judgment. So yeah, there's there's a fair number of G stories out there and a whole lot of PG stories. Okay, so in in the intro to the show, you often talk about yourself and your family and things, and and this makes listeners really feel like they know you, and it makes the show feel a lot more friendly and personal. Um, but you also, I guess, lose some of your privacy. I mean, how do you balance those considerations? I try not to make my wife mad at me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you mean like talking about your bedroom rituals? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. We'll see if she listens to this podcast. Or not. <laughs> um, yeah, it's essentially 
I started doing that because I felt that as audio entertainment, I couldn't just say, hi, here's a story. It's by this person. You know, read the thing, then come back and say, we hope you enjoyed it. Bye now. You know, it, it, it felt like every show you see on television, you know, has, has there's there's more framing than that. And I didn't know what to say for framing besides just, you know, little bitty anecdotes about, you know, I mean, Alex was a baby when, when we started this stuff in 2005. He was, he was born in March that year. I, I started podcast in May. So yes, my wife thinks I'm insane. <laughs> um, and it just, it just sort of grew out from there. Um, I felt pretty comfortable with it. I'm, I have, I've never been someone who has a whole lot of personal boundaries. You know, it's, it's not that I don't respect other people's privacy. It's just that I felt like, okay, I'm comfortable with where I am. If I was going to get fired from a job for saying what I'm going to say on the podcast, I guess it's not the right job for me. And, you know, I, I just I act like myself as much as possible. And other people are strange enough to enjoy that to some degree. So <laughs> folks who aren't, I guess, aren't listening to the podcast, so I don't hear from them a lot. <laughs> Having written like several hundred of those intros, do you have any <laughs> any, any thoughts on that? I mean, how do you keep coming up with uh, material? <laughs> the, way, the way you put it, I'm getting a bit dizzy now. All of a sudden, <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know. I it yeah, I I think about it each week. <laughs> Sometimes far too late on a Wednesday night if the podcast has to go out on Thursday. <laughs> And uh, I, like, I do the geek dad intros sometimes where I talk about my kid and we've got another kid on the way now. And, uh, you know, it's just, it just happens to, it's whatever I think to talk about it at the time. And it's, it's usually not hard to fill a couple of hundred words, which is what uh, we, I moved it from the intro to the outro after a couple of years. Uh, some people really were complaining that yes, the story was good, but Steve talks too damn much in the beginning. <laughs> and I kind of saw their point a little bit and I didn't think, couldn't think of what to do about it until I heard Al on Pseudopod and Alistair Stewart, uh, who always put his commentary at the back end at the outro. And I thought, that makes so much sense. Why didn't I think of that? Cause, uh, I, I still, get, I still talk about what I'm going to talk about, but no one has to be tapping their foot waiting for the story to start. After the story is done, if you don't like any of it, you can just turn it off then. It also makes it easier to address the story directly because a lot of the time the stories provoke some thought in me or something that I find interesting to talk about. And if I do that before the story, well, I'm getting spoilers. So afterwards, it's a bit easier to wax philosophical a bit. What do you think of the current podcasting scene in general, and where do you see things going in the next few years? I think it was a bad and a good thing that podcasting seems to have settled down beyond the initial bubble of hype. And from 2005, 2006, all of the media who sort of missed blogging as, as the rise of the phenomenon latched onto podcasting. And the New York Times was doing all of these podcasting articles. And, you know, there were all of these podcast directories popping up all over the place. And everybody thought that it was going to be the next huge thing and it was going to be bigger than blogging. That didn't really happen, I think, because podcasting is – there's there's more back-end work to put a podcast out than there is just to type out a blog post fairly quickly. Uh, so you have to be relatively invested in your subject. I don't know what you want to do to make a podcast. So I mean, it certainly hasn't died down. You know, every TV show has a podcast. Every, you know, everybody has a podcast as part of their standard media efforts. It's like um, any bum has a podcast these days. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but we're, we're yeah, you know, us right here we're the cream of the crop. <laughs> but but I I take that as a good thing because it means that the folks listening now, you know, it's not a brand new word to most of the potential audience, um, and they kind of know what it is they want to look for, and the 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 silly hype has died down, and now we can start to discover what it really is. And I think what it really is is a chance for specialized target messages to go out to people who really care about that stuff. You know, there's there, there's always going to be a smattering of talk show kinds of podcasts. Uh, you know, some will be successful if the host is really that brilliant. But the ones that I really see succeeding are things like Grammar Girl. You know, it's a five-minute grammar podcast, and she's been on Oprah, and she has a best-selling book out uh, because – she happens to be really good at presenting grammar in, in five-minute snippets, and amazingly enough, there are people who care and, and who, who want to learn more, get their bosses to learn more. 
Um, and she's built a whole network of tip-oriented podcasts from that. One of my favorite podcasts of all time was a podcast called 12 Byzantine Rulers, which oh, was yeah. about Byzantine history. And I thought it sounded like a dry subject too, but someone recommended it to me, and it was a professor in, in New York who cared about the subject matter so much that the stories he told were fascinating. So, Dave, uh, did Oprah call us yet to book us on the show? Was she one of the people who, who lined us up for an interview? Or, wait, was was it no one has? I, or? I, I, I had my cell phone turned off, so maybe, oh, maybe okay. that's what it was. <laughs> Actually, when you brought up uh, the Byzantine uh, History podcast, I was going to ask, um, what other podcasts do you really that you would recommend to listeners of this one? Well, again, you know, what, what I'm interested in isn't necessarily what anyone else is going to be interested in. But uh, for fiction podcasts... Obviously, I know a fantastic fantasy podcast and a great horror podcast. The Drabblecast is one of my favorites. Uh, it's Norm Sherman. He does. Uh, it's mostly a flash fiction podcast. He tends to run the shorter stories, um, but he does it with music and great production values and just really, really funny um, bits at, at the beginning and end. And he's, he's not to everyone's taste, but I find him hilarious. And he, he he runs some of the stranger stories out there. Dakota Ring Theater is one of my favorites. They, they're they a pulp radio podcast, sort of trying to bring back the style of radio from the 30s. They do two series. Uh, there's a kind of a crime-fighting, the shadow-like series called The Red Panda Adventures. And uh, then there's Blackjack Justice, which is more of a Mickey Spillane detective kind of thing. Um, I like the Metamorph City podcast. He does a... Uh, Kind of a, a, a cyberpunkish fantasy shadow run style uh, world, uh, where she's done several short stories in and one full length novel so far, uh, with another one coming on the way. And he, he was one of the vanguard of this current wave of producing your podcast novel by getting a whole bunch of other podcasters to do the voices and making a full cast recording out of it, uh, which is a lot of work, but Chris Lester showed that it could be done really well. I'm sure you meant to say the wonderful Tor Dot Stories podcast produced by Mer Lafferty here on Tor Dot, and you just assume that all of our listeners already listen to it. So, so no, I yeah, Mer Mer is awesome, and uh, yeah, it's, it's I I was twittering about that as soon as I saw it, and I am I'm thrilled that yeah, the tour is putting a you know, a podcast out. So yeah, I'm a huge supporter of what Tor does. I read the I read the site all the time. <laughs> cool. All right. Well, uh, Steve Ely of Escape Pod, thanks so much for joining us on Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Thanks for having me. And that was our interview. All right. Thanks so much to Steve for joining us on the show. So it's it's really been exciting for me the last few years with all the pod, the fiction podcasts coming up because I really enjoy audio fiction. But you know, until iPods came around and digital distribution, it was just such a pain listening to anything on audiobooks that I almost never did it. You know, back when stuff was on cassette tape, you know, they were just really expensive and just messing with cassette tapes is really a pain. And, uh, you know, we always used to listen to um, audio books, my, my family, when we would take car trips. But since we just didn't have <laughs> that many uh, things on audio books, basically all we had was Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, the, the uh, original BBC radio drama and The Hobbit. And so we would just listen to those every single car trip. So... I don't even hmm. know how many times I've listened to those those two things. I mean, over 20 times, I would say. Um, but so now that stuff's coming out digitally, you know, I've probably listened to hundreds, hundreds of audiobooks in the last couple of years. Yeah, in recent years, there's been seems to be a, a huge explosion in um, in audiobook uh, publishing in general. But uh, specifically, it's been noticeable in uh, science fiction and fantasy because. In uh, in previous years, there was a very very limited selection of uh, audiobooks available from those genres, and it was and if, if it, anything was on audio, it would only be from the big bestsellers like Neil Gaiman or uh, uh, you know people like that. Uh, uh, also, like many of the Star Trek and Star Wars novelizations. So, if if you wanted anything any actual original science fiction, uh, it was pretty slim pickings, and uh, frequently stuff was released in uh, abridged format. And so uh, that's been another revolution that's happened over recent years, uh, largely in part due to Stephen King apparently uh, being a big fan of audiobooks and demanding that his books are only released in unabridged format, which I which I applaud because uh, as a as a reader, uh, I, I I mean even though it makes an audiobook very long sometimes, I mean I'd rather I'd much rather listen to the whole audiobook 
Yeah, no, I, I hate those abridged books. And, and then you don't you really feel like you've read the book. You know, you, you feel like if you tell people like, oh, I read that book. Mm -hmm. Like, no, I didn't. I, I just, I, I, I got the six hour version, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, like I listened to Snow Crash on audio and uh, I, I quite enjoyed it. But then I realized a couple of years later, oh, yeah, you know what? That was an abridged version. So, yeah, I mean, I'm not entirely sure that I have gotten the full experience of it, you know? And, you know, sometimes they just do things when they abridge it. You know, they cut out your favorite parts or, you know, like one of my favorite book series is Roger Zelazny's Chronicles of Amber. Ugh. And when they they produce this, <laughs> this abridged version of it with sort of we just weird sound effects. So when uh, in Nine Princes and Amber, when um, Corwin and Random are being chased by Julian's uh, storm hounds, you know, the narrator is just reading the story. And in the background, you just hear like, rah, 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 rah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just... It, it, I mean, and I tried to get John to listen to it. He's like, I I'm not listening to this. You know, I mean, I, uh, I, I groaned when you started mentioning this. Uh, I should tell our listeners, not because of, of the books themselves, but because, you know, we've had this conversation before. And, uh, and I did try to listen to that first one, and it's so terrible. It's, oh. Um, and the really sad part about that is that apparently, okay, so these books are read by Roger Zlazny himself, and he's actually quite a good reader. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, he doesn't do a lot of fancy things with his voice or anything, but he's really compelling. And so these were all recorded unabridged, and they were published that way, but then this company that currently has the rights, they, they took the unabridged recordings and abridged them and you know added all these annoying sound effects. And it's like so frustrating because like I really want to listen to the unabridged recording, and they're just impossible to find. And apparently, you know, I was just reading that he apparently he, apparently he did those all in one take. It's just hmm. uh, it's just unbelievable. I don't know if that's actually true or not, but it, it's either true or something close to that is true that he just sat down and just read the books and you just know, like us on the show, you know, we, yeah, just we like, do everything one take. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. So you know, us and Roger Zelazny, just uh, audio uh, Phenoms? virtuosos, virtuosos. Yeah. Yes, there you go. But I mean, I really, I really like the when you get these audiobooks digitally because they're so portable. And I mean, you know, like I listened to *The Time Traveler's Wife* by Audrey Niffenegger as I was riding my bicycle across the Netherlands, and mm -hmm. that was just just the ideal situation for listening to an audiobook. I mean, the whole country is flat, you know, so you mm -hmm. don't have to go up any hills or anything. And the weather was really nice, and I just love that book so much. And I wonder if I had just listened to it, or if I just read the book normally, if I would if I would enjoy it as much as I did. Uh, I also listened to that audiobook, and I agree it's actually quite a good audio. But, I mean, that, that sort of brings up uh, um, something that I, I find interesting. Uh, you know, that book has two different narrators that uh, sort of take turns telling the story, and one's a man and one's a woman. And so um, I always like it when audiobook productions actually do incorporate that into the audiobook in that, you know, they had two different narrators, one reading one point of view, one reading the other. Because a lot of times, if there's a book that has very, uh, many different points of view, uh, they try to make one narrator do everything, and it just usually doesn't work out. And it's hard, and sometimes it's hard to figure out, like, oh, well, like who is talking now? Like, you know, because the voice sounds all the same. When you're reading it, it's not that way, because like you, you can keep in mind easier, I think. But when you have the same voice actually reading it to you throughout the whole story, even though it's different points of view, it can get confusing. Although I don't, I'm not a big fan of when actors try to like give each character a different voice. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it does make it clearer who's talking a lot, but it it just I find it distracting. You know, I would mm -hmm. I, I would you know, especially when they give characters funny accents and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I I would just rather they read the words, and I let, I would let my imagination do that mm -hmm. for me. Yeah, I mean, there's there's kind of two two schools of thought with audiobooks. One is to sort of have a very vanilla narration and just and like you say, let let your mind do the uh, imagining there, um, just as if you were reading a book. Like there's some narrators, like I think there's uh like Stefan Rudnicki is one of these guys who I really like. He's very compelling to listen to. Uh, he doesn't do a lot with uh, voices and whatnot, and he's sort of, he's one of these guys who I think does just sort of directly channel the audiobook book right into your brain instead of uh trying to interpret it too much um and i think that's one of his strengths whereas uh, there are other narrators who i think do a really good job bringing the stories to life with voices and doing other things but i mean it depends on the actor it depends on the book i think well i mean you've uh, you've been reviewing audiobooks for a while yeah. now um mm -hmm. so i mean you really have a lot of experience with this i mean what what would be an example of a book that does where the actor does voices really well um, well, I mean, anything that Neil Gaiman reads, you know, I mean, he, he reads, I mean, basically only his own things, but, you know, he's, he's a really great reader and he does different voices for things and, uh, and he's just a really, uh, a pleasure to listen to. There, there's a, there's a novel that I listen to 
um, on audio that wasn't an audio book, but it was a podcast. But uh, uh, Jack Kincaid, uh, who actually produced and performed our, our intro and outro uh, music that you hear, he uh, he has a novel called Hodes Grimm, which uh, he released as a, as a podcast. And he totally goes to town with the voices. And, and uh, I mean, he incorporates some other people, but I mean, he, he does almost all of them himself. And it really is completely different. Um, I mean, he has a, he even has a, a special voice that he uses for the narrator that is not his own, you know, regular voice. So, I mean, he really, really did a lot of work to really make it into something special. And I mean, I, I really loved it. I mean, it, it's only been published as a podcast, but I mean, I think it really, you know, deserves to be published in print form. You know, I mean, if you like horror novels, like if you like Stephen King and, and that kind of thing, I mean, I, I highly re- recommend it. A, a George R. R. Martin's um, collection, Dream Songs, was uh, put onto audio in like three different parts because it's like hugely long and it's all short stories. So they just sort of broke it up. And uh, one of the, you know, there's these two novellas that Martin wrote that are set in the Song of Ice and Fire uh, milieu. And uh, so the guy who reads them, uh, I, I don't remember his name, but the guy who reads them on the audiobook is just uh, fantastic. So first of all, he's American, or he, uh, I believe he's American, but he he narrates everything in just a you know American voice, you know, no accent. But then all the all the voices have a, a distinct sort of accent to them, like sort of British sounding. Uh, but I mean, uh, he has a different one for each character, and it just it really makes it so different to have the distinct narrator voice, completely different from the dialogue voices. You know, because sometimes when you're listening to an audiobook, one of the problems is, is like you can't tell if someone's thinking something or if they're actually saying it because the narrator, you know, obviously like you can't see italics. I mean, a good a good narrator can somehow convey it, but um unless you sort of get into sound effects and whatnot, there's really no way to uh, convey that. Like I remember one time um there was a Asimov science fiction magazine was being adapted to audiobook on on, on audible.com and uh I remember they did one thing that was, I thought was really cool. This actually may have been an analog come to think of it, but anyway, um Michael Swanwick's story Slow Life. Uh, a good part of the story was actually in italics because it sort of uh, was depicting an alien point of view. And uh one of the things they did on audio to distinguish that from the other parts of the story where they sort of had this uh quiet music playing in the background just to sort of indicate that, you know, this is something else. And uh, I, I always find that interesting when people incorporate those things. Uh, it's easy to it's easy to overdo something like that, and it's easy to really turn off the reader. But in that case, it worked out really well. Well, I mean, it's interesting that you mentioned stuff like not being able to tell from the audio version what's speech and what's thought, mm-hmm. because I think most writers going back here has never really thought about their books being turned into audio, and so they didn't write with that in mind. Mm-hmm. And I feel like now I I, I sort of. I don't really have any numbers, but I, I suspect that as many or more people listen to podcasts of my short stories than read the, you know, the, the text forums. And so I really mm-hmm. put just as much thought into whether this is going to make sense on audio as whether mm-hmm. it's going to make sense on the page. It's like one thing I think is, is just the best tool for writers to come along in a long time is text to speech software. And this is just, it's just such a, a big help. Um, it's, it's so good for um, catching typos. Um, because if you write a sentence like he walked down the street and you actually wrote he walked down the street, it's, it's really hard to notice that the the is missing there because your mind knows what it's supposed to say and your, your brain will just kind of fill in the missing words. Whereas if you're listening to it, immediately you think, wait, that doesn't sound right. Something, something's missing there. It's actually become a, a big part of my writing process now as I, you know, as I'm working on a story, I'll just have the computer read it to me and I'm thinking about, how does this work on audio? And then I'll actually convert it to an MP3 file, you know, whatever, however much of the story I have done, and put it on my iPod and then just go out in the evening and listen to it and think about what I'm going to write the next day. Yeah, and uh, that text-to-speech software has come a long way. Um, you know, it doesn't sound like the robot voice that it uh, did when it first sort of started. Um, and some of them are actually quite good. And, uh, and you know, like I know you you've listened to your own stories read aloud to you. And I think you even read other stories that way sometimes. But um, I was very skeptical of that when you were talking to me about it. And, uh, and I did try it out a little bit and I can see how it is at least um, something that you could listen to. But um, I mean, I don't, I don't foresee myself doing that. Um, but uh, you know, I, I think it's, it's got to come a long way in order for it to replace audiobook narration. But yeah, I mean that I could definitely see it as a very good tool for writers. But no, no, it's, it's true that I, Pretty much everything these days that I read online, fiction that I read online, I have the computer read it out loud to me. 
um, so, you know, like um, webzines and, you know, um, manuscripts from other people that I'm, I'm reading because I just do so much reading that after <laughs> after hours and hours, I just can't concentrate anymore. Uh, you know, my eyes can't concentrate anymore, but my ears can still concentrate. And so if the computer is reading it to me, I, I can extend the amount of reading I can do for a few more hours. Like when I've been doing these reprint anthologies, if there's a story that was available like on a skate pod or a pseudopod or a podcast or something or wherever, um, I would look to see if uh, like if there's something I, I had on my list of things that I wanted to hunt down to read, I would definitely look and see if it was available there because uh, um, when I was still working at FNSF, I had a commute, so I would be driving to work. I could listen to the podcast on the way to work. So that's that's one less story I have to I have to read at home um, to evaluate. I mean, you know, before I made any final decisions, I would probably sit and read it myself anyway because the audio reading experience is very different than reading it in print. And sometimes a good narrator can actually make something so much better than it is on the page that you can't trust that when making an editorial decision. And it's interesting because, you know, because, you know, we go to uh, these readings, uh, these live readings often in, in, in New York, like the KGB Fantastic Fiction Reading Series. And it, it is it is quite interesting when you go and you, and you listen and you can you can be a huge fan of an author and you hear them read and, you you know, you can just not be interested at all. But then if you go back and read that same story, it can be you can love it. And sort of the opposite is true as well. Like uh, there are certain authors who are just such good readers that it's impossible to actually go home and then read their read. The, like I say, they read the first half of their story. You go home and you read, you know, and you want to finish reading the story. And it's like, Jesus is just not the same. I mean, it's like even though like I was so totally wrapped up in it when he was reading, when I come home and try to finish it, it's like it's just I, I don't want to I don't want to finish reading this. I want him to finish reading it to me. Um, yeah, no, and I mean, that's another big suggestion I would have for aspiring writers. You know, A is get the text-to-speech software and use it. It's great. And B, go to see authors read their work in, in public. I mean, one of the liabilities of being a writer is that it's so solitary and you don't really get much feedback. You know, it's not like if you're a stand-up comedian or something and you tell a joke and nobody laughs, you're like, hmm. okay, well, cross that joke off my list. But if you're a writer and you're publishing stories and you don't, you don't have a lot of feedback. And so it's really good, I think, to go and, and just watch authors read and see how the crowd reacts and see what authors, you know, what authors are interesting and, and who, who aren't. And, and, honest, and honestly, most aren't. Um, and I think that's a, you can learn from that because it really gives you a different perspective on how much, how much exposition you can get away with and how, mm -hmm. how long of a story do people, are people really willing to sit there and, and listen to. And it's just good, I mean, to get out. You can meet people. You can meet writers a lot of the time. You can meet readers and just talk to them about what, they, what they're interested in and what they get out of this author's work. And you see how sort of different kinds of people go to see different kinds of authors. And, and it's really, a lot of times you'll see new authors giving their first reading. And they don't, have, they don't know what to do. They're, they're like, what am I supposed to do? Am I supposed to, <laughs> am I supposed to read something? Am I supposed to answer questions? I don't know. I've never been to one of these hmm. things before. And mm -hmm. I'm kind of like, you know, your first, the first reading that you ever go to should not be one where you're the author. You mm -hmm. I mean, seriously, mm -hmm. go to, I mean, it's obviously if you live in New York or LA, it's a lot easier to go to things than if, if you live in, in some less populated area, but you should definitely try to go to, you should definitely take any opportunity you can to, to go to as many as you can. Oh, so you were talking about before about writing with audio in mind. Um, you know, some authors certainly do that. Like I, I think Neil Gaiman must just given the way he performs his own work so well, but I know Orson Scott Card specifically does, and he said so. And uh, he's sort of always written that way uh, with the idea of uh, his his work being read aloud. He's he's written that with that in mind. Um, and it's only you know since audiobooks sort of became popular, and he's had his own audiobooks you know produced that uh, you know that sort of uh, you know paid dividends for him. But because he does that, like I've always felt like he's really a great author to check out on audio. Like if you if you're not familiar with audiobooks, you haven't tried that many, definitely check out some more since got card books. Um, like Ender's Game is a fantastic audiobook. Although uh, I, I will say uh, some of the some of the later entries in the series, like the Shadow series, um, there's a character named Ashiel. Uh, his name is spelled, it looks like Achilles, but it's pronounced Ashiel. And so I thought it was kind of funny. Um, there's multiple narrators reading the book, and so some of them pronounce it Achilles, and some of them pronounce it Ashiel. Uh -huh. and, and the funny thing is, it actually says in the book his name is pronounced Ashiel because somebody else reads it and thinks it's Achilles, and they correct him. <laughs> so it's like, okay, well, obviously not everybody read the whole book. They only read the parts that they were supposed to read, you know? Mm. Uh, so, I mean, that's, that's a little frustrating sometimes. And, and of course, sometimes people just mispronounce things. 
and it's especially awkward if you uh if you know you're a long time reader like say say you read all the Robert Jordan Wheel of Time books and then you suddenly you go listen to the audiobook and the narrator is like pronouncing all of the names completely differently from how you had pronounced them in your head uh and who who who's to say which one's right i mean it could be that you were right it could be that they're right but it's it's it is weird although actually it's funny i i would i would have said that epic fantasy would be like the ideal thing to listen to on audio because there's all these hard to pronounce words in the text and it's like oh well now you're offloading that responsibility to the narrator all, all you have to do is listen to it <laughs> but actually I, I found i found that that's not true at all like in terms at least for me like i mean i i'll enjoy reading epic fantasy uh from time to time but i cannot listen to it on audio like i don't know what it is i don't know if it's because it's such a huge canvas uh there's so many characters in general that it's just really hard to follow but like i've tried like on a number of occasions a number of different authors even authors that i actually do really really like like um george martin i just cannot get into the audiobooks on those well actually i mean i was just going to mention that was one that the names were driving me crazy because uh you know like there's a character who i whose name i think is peter baelish and his name is just sort of a, a novel spelling of peter with a y mm -hmm. and the audiobook narrator pronounces it patire and mm -hmm. just every single time that character was making mm -hmm. it was driving me crazy and you know, there's only there's only so much you can do as an author. Like even if you pr provide the pronunciation key, it's like you know who who actually knows how to read those things. I mean, <laughs> you know, I, I'm an editor, and I don't I don't really understand how to read them. I mean, I I can sort of try and puzzle it out, but I mean, chances of me getting it right are slim. You know, so uh, that's always going to happen unless you sort of have an audiobook as the first thing, or you know, there's a movie or something that makes it seem more official how to pronounce something. But you know, earlier when I was talking about. Uh, how being an author is kind of lonely and how you don't get a lot of feedback. That's actually one thing that the podcasting has changed to a substantial mm -hmm. degree because, you know, it used to be you would publish a story in a magazine and, you you, you know, your understanding is that tens of thousands of people read this, but, you know, maybe you would get a couple emails saying, hey, I like your story, or, and, and otherwise you wouldn't hear really anything. You know, <laughs> Don Marquis uh, famously said that uh, publishing a book of poetry and waiting for the public response was like dropping rose petals into the Grand Canyon and waiting to hear the boom when they hit the bottom. Huh. And uh, and that's what that's basically what publishing short stories has been like for a long time, but now that's completely changed. And and so you go on, you know, like with Escape Pod, they have this this big message board that 50 or more people often will post uh, responses to a, a story. And so, uh, you know, if you have a story like on Escape Pod or, or Pseudopod, you, you know, you're, you're sort of terrified, I guess, as, as Steve was saying, to, to read the message boards. And, hmm. But it's really interesting and uh, just to see people's responses. And I, I've kind of been torn about whether so far I haven't gotten really involved in the in, in the discussions. Um, I, I'm sort of conflicted about whether to do that or not. I mean, on one hand, I think people think it's cool that authors get involved and take an interest in, in um, interacting with readers and stuff. But on the other hand, I don't want to I don't want to get dragged into flame wars, <laughs> you know, and I don't want to say, you know, like stop a discussion in the middle saying like, no, this is, you know, people will argue about what the story meant or what a fact was. And if the author just comes and says, no, actually, it was this. Mm -hmm. It seems like maybe that's just bringing the conversation to a screeching halt. Right, right. Uh, you know, it's interesting, uh, although that's helped with um, maybe short stories, uh, you know, getting feedback uh, via the podcast uh, of the story. Um, it really hasn't um, changed much for audiobooks. Like one of the reasons I got involved in reviewing audiobooks in the first place is because almost no one reviewed them at the time. I, I mean, I guess I first started in maybe 2002 or something like that. I, I pitched an audiobook review column to Locus. I mean, audiobooks in general were getting reviewed very rarely, and science fiction and fantasy almost never. You know, there was a, there's a magazine called Audiophile, which is an audiobook review magazine, um, and uh, they they still uh, pretty rarely cover uh, science fiction or fantasy audiobooks, but um, at least they cover some things. But I mean, the thing is, e even since then, I mean, there there really isn't a lot of there aren't a lot of reviews of audiobooks being published anywhere. There is a there is a good website called SFF Audio, um, which um, reviews exclusively science fiction and fantasy audiobooks. It's a good thing to it's a good thing to sort of follow the RSS feed for if you're interested in audiobooks because uh they, they post a lot of notices about new audiobooks being released and, and of course they publish reviews from time to time. So I mean it's uh, it's still sort of tough going if you wanna make an informed purchase about an audiobook. Although fortunately now with the sort of digital audiobook revolution here, you can listen to samples of almost anything now before you buy it. Whereas back when I first started reviewing audiobooks, not only were there no reviews, but I couldn't even listen to the narrator. 
um, before I bought the audiobook. And I mean, the thing a lot of people don't consider is that the narrator is really just as important as the author, whether or not you're going to enjoy the audiobook. Because if the author is great and you just have a terrible narrator or the narrator is a terrible fit for the, for the author's work, you're not going to enjoy it. And, you know, I mean, uh, on, on the other side of things, uh, a, a good narrator can actually make a, a subpar story much, much better. You know, it's, uh, so it's, it, it is kind of vitally important to sample and listen to narrators before you, you know, spend any money on an audiobook. I'll, I will say, in addition to um, listening to samples online, like if you go to audible.com or whatever, you can listen to samples of everything that they have, and, and a lot of other sort of audiobook publishers have samples on their sites. But one of the other things you can do is, um, you know, if you have a good library system in your county or city, oftentimes, even if they don't have, if you have a county system, even if, if they don't have the audiobook at your branch, you know, you can use interlibrary loan. And like where I live, I mean, in New Jersey, I can get almost every, any audiobook that's actually published just within the, you know, from, from any, from some of the branches, uh, in the, in the county library system. You know, they're all on CD now. So, I mean, if you want to still listen to it on your iPod, you can rip them and put them on the iPod. And I should point out that if you're going to do that, there's a good program uh, that costs about 15 bucks called Markable. And uh, you can just download that and it sort of facilitates the ripping of audiobooks and it'll merge it all into one file so that you don't have like a hundred tracks of, of three minutes each uh, when you're trying to listen to an audiobook. And it makes it, it makes it bookmarkable, which is probably where the name comes from. Uh, but so, you know, if you stop listening to it after an hour, you know, it'll pick up where you left off, uh, just like books from Audible do. And actually, a fun fact, uh, the guy who uh, created Markable is uh, the author David Roland Grigg, who published a story who I uh, who I published in my anthology Wastelands. His story, A Song Before a Sunset, appeared in Wastelands. Um, and actually, uh, now that I mentioned that, I should bring up uh, Telltale Weekly, um, which is sort of a, a proto podcast. Uh, before uh, Before podcasting really took off, there was this online digital audiobook company called Telltale Weekly, and they were releasing um, they're releasing new products every week or so. But it, it wasn't free typically. Some some of the stories would be free, but some of them would cost like ninety nine cents. So it was sort of a micro micro pay sort of operation. It's run by Alex Wilson. Um, I believe it's on hiatus now, but um, not it's not dead for sure. But it's uh, still there, available if you want to buy anything. I would highly recommend listening to the audiobook version of A Song Before Sunset because that's the first place I listened to it. And it's because of Telltale Weekly that I included it in Wastelands. Uh, I had never heard of the author or the story, so but the audiobook version is so good. I just I was so in love with it as, as soon as I heard it, and like because it, it sort of deals with music, and uh, they sort of weave in some nice piano playing at some point. Cause it's about a guy who who uh, it's a post apocalyptic story about a guy who's like trying to play piano again, and he has to tune the piano and get it back to working and all this. And so just at the right moments in the story, he, he plays some piano music in the background and just really added a lot. Definitely check that out. There's actually a bunch of other uh, good stories on there as well, uh, including some by uh, Tom Gerenser, Toby Buckell. You know, there's a whole science fiction section they have over there. So, uh, you know, it's worth checking out. I mean, some of them cost, a, you know, a dollar or two or whatever, but, uh, you know, that's almost free. Well, you know, speaking of proto podcasts, you know, actually the first podcast I was involved with was this one called Mech Muse, mm -hmm. and they had, I, I think, uh, sort of a lesson for for podcasters. I mean, they they had more of a traditional magazine model they were going for, where they spent a lot of money up front getting, you know, artwork and best selling authors and professional voice actors and you know professional music, and and they really did a great job. Um, and then you were supposed to pay you know, to download the the issue. And, you know, I, I, I don't know the numbers, but I don't think very many people were downloading it. And so almost immediately they made it they they made it free to download and then you could pay more for a um sort of higher quality version. And then it only went to uh two episodes, which was really a shame because you know, as an author it's really nice having that kind of production uh and artwork mm -hmm. and everything for your story. But it seems like what Steve did with Escape Pod is just a lot more suited to the kind of podcasting landscape is just to start out small and mm -hmm. uh, make it available for free and build up an audience and, and solicit donations. And, you know, we were talking about how, how much Steve sort of um, talks about his, his life and his family and his thoughts and stuff on the show. So you really feel like you know him. And so then when he's... And that was bedroom practices. <laughs> and so then when, you know, when he's like, hey, we could really use some support, it's not just some mm -hmm. um, nameless thing. It's like, oh, you're like, it's like Steve, you know, like it was the same th same thing with uh, Starship Sofa. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there was a point at which uh, Tony Smith, you know, I had been listening to the podcast for, for maybe a year or so. And, and Tony Smith, I think, had some sort of uh, 
health problems and had fallen and hit his head and was in the hospital and he was kind of like you know if anyone was thinking about contributing money to this podcast now would be a good time because i could <laughs> use money you know mm-hmm. like, oh no it's no it's tony oh i'll give money you know mm-hmm. whereas if it was just you know i never feel that way about giving money to nbc or something like that you know it's mm-hmm. uh, so I really think that that's sort of the model for podcasters is to establish kind of a, a rapport with your readership. And then people will, you know, they could download your stuff for free off of Torrent and, you know, there's nothing stopping them to, but they want to support you because they, they know you and, you know, they want to, to help out. Yeah, did I mention that I, I fell and hit my head recently, actually, too, and, uh, <laughs> and I was just in the hospital and, you know, I, uh, you know, we're going to set up a, you know, PayPal account where, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Okay, so let's uh, talk about a couple uh, escape specific escape pod episodes. Mm-hmm. Uh, one that Steve mentioned was Isaac Asimov's Nightfall, uh, that was voted, you know, at some point uh, the the best science fiction short story of all time. Uh, and this mm-hmm. is definitely, you know, just uh, one that people should check out. The premise is that it's set on an alien world that orbits uh, a number of suns, uh, six or seven or so, uh, in such a way that it's always daytime, except every millennia or so the planet experiences nightfall, you know, for the first time in, in living memory. And so then everybody freaks out and, and civilization collapses. Mm-hmm. And so um, in the present of the story, the uh, scientists on this world have been, you know, have been doing archaeology and have discovered that civilization collapses every thousand years or, or what have you. And they don't know why. And they sort of, but they're sort of suspecting that there's something about darkness descending. And, uh, and so, I mean, I don't want to, say any more really about the story but uh i wanted to talk about how this was an idea that asimov was sort of uh inspired to write by his editor uh john w campbell and uh campbell would often give the same idea to different writers confident that they would turn out completely different stories Mm -hmm. and so the idea he gave was that you know people who see the stars for the first time and they've never heard of the stars before was was the Mm -hmm. idea Mm-hmm. Uh, and he so he gave this idea to Asimov, and he also gave the exact same idea to Robert Heinlein, who wrote it as uh, the, bo- the the story that became the novel Orphans of the Sky, in which mm-hmm. there are people in a generation starship, which is you know a, a ship flying. You know, it takes years probably to fly between stars. So the idea of a generation ship is that you know you would have g- generations living and dying on the ship, and so it would be the the great 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 grandchildren or something of the original passengers who would actually arrive on the planet so in this in this uh, story there's been a disaster on the ship and so the people have forgotten that they're on a ship they think that the entire universe Mm. is this ship and Mm -hmm. there's nothing out there's nothing beyond the ship and so at the end they kind of make it into the cockpit and look out the window and see the stars for the first time so you get these Ah. two just great stories out of the same Mm -hmm. uh, premise i haven't i haven't read that one but that sounds that actually sounds awesome although uh did you just spoil it though completely oh (laughs) (laughs) Spoiler uh, alert! I don't remember if I mean I think I think the I fact, mean to be to be fair, what is it like fifty years old or something? I mean you know. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. I mean certainly I knew maybe because my parents had told me, but I, I certainly knew the premise from the beginning. I don't remember if it's clear from the. I think actually the the cover of the edition I read is <laughs> people in the cockpit looking out at the star. <laughs> so uh-huh. certainly the the cover and I probably the cover copy spoils it if if it's not clear from the story itself. <clears throat> But uh, so some some of the other stories uh, on Escape Pod that I just I kind of glanced over the list and these are a few that jumped out at me. Um, the first one is called Seamstress by Sarah Pernius. Uh, and this is a story I, I read years ago in, in Realms of Fantasy and it's really stuck with me. And, you know, in, um, say, Cinderella, when the I had always kind of wondered, you know, when they summon when the fairy godmother summons up a carriage. Clearly, the fairy godmother's mind is not specifying all the details of this carriage, right? It seems like there must be some other intelligence at work deciding exactly how long is the axle and what color is the trim and and all this kinds of stuff. And who's actually making these decisions? And where's this stuff coming from? And so in in the story, basically, the idea is that when people magically summon things, they don't just come out of thin air, that there's actually kind of a fairy tale sweatshop where all this stuff is made. And so all these kind of fairy creatures work in this sweatshop, just making magic, you know, making carriages and boots and mm-hmm. dresses and things. And uh, and so the characters have to try to escape from this this horrible uh, sweatshop. Hmm. And I always like it when fantasy stories, I mean, not every fantasy story has to do this, but I always like it when it has some sort of, it makes you look at the, the real world in a new way. 
And when I read that story, it kind of made me think that in the U.S., we kind of have this same sort of attitude that, you know, you go to the grocery store and there's all this meat and it just appears wrapped in plastic and it's almost like magic and you don't really ever have to think about where it comes from or who made it or what their lives were like. You know, this is sort of the same thing with uh, sweatshirts at Walmart or whatever. And so you just read this story and, and think, yeah, you know, there's really, I mean, you know, Orson Scott Card in his book on writing science fiction has this discussion about the cost of magic and that a story is often more interesting if magic is not just some free lunch, but there's some sort of cost. And, and he, he kind of talks about it in terms of the cost to you, the, the sacrifices you have to make in order to do magic. But another way to look at it, which is what this seamstress story does, is there's a cost somewhere. And maybe you're not paying the cost, but maybe somebody else is. Um, so, so check that one out. Do you, do you have? Yeah, no. Um, yeah, I mean, I have quite a few uh, that I really enjoyed. I mean, I mentioned that I, uh, when I was doing my anthologies, I would listen to stories that have been podcast first, um, if at all possible, just because it saves me some reading time. But one of them was uh, Stockholm Syndrome by David Tallerman, uh, which appeared on po- uh, Pseudopod. Actually, originally appeared on Pseudopod, so it wasn't. It, it was the only way to actually read it. Um, but I mean, that was one that I, I just really, really loved. And, uh, I liked it so much. I put it in the living dead and, uh, they actually published, uh, several other zombie stories that I went on to include. Uh, uh, they also had, um, everything's better with zombies by Hannah Wolf Bowen, um, on the podcast already, I believe. And I'd listened to that again. I had read it already, but, and so I had remembered it, but, uh, it was nice to be able to just reread it on there. And then of course, uh, after I, decided to reprint your story, the Skullface Boy, uh, then uh, Pseudopod podcast it. And I just want to mention it because I just love the narration in that so much. Uh, this guy, Ralph Walters, it's he, he has this really, really intense narration style that just like I just loved. Uh, and I mean, it was very gripping to listen to. I've actually done all I can to get uh, the various podcasts interested in my anthologies to see if I can get them to actually adapt some of the stories to to podcasts because a I, I like listening to stories and b it's like you know hey it's a it's good uh sort of marketing it's like you know hey they have a large audience and and if they listen to the story that was in my anthology and they like it you know maybe they'll want to read the rest of the anthology so uh, i was thinking actually uh in the show notes we'll include a list of stories uh that have appeared in my anthologies that are also available online for free as podcasts because by default, I kind of approve of all of them because I put them in my anthology. So that'll be my reading list for you guys. Uh, an- another one that was recently on uh, on Escape Pod is uh, Infestation by Garth Nix, which yeah. uh, was in my uh, anthology by Blood We Live. Um, it had quite good narration as well, I thought. Um, I, I and- second that. That was a great story. Another one I was going to mention was uh, The 43 Antarian Dynasties by Mike Resnick. Uh, mm-hmm. Actually, I read this years ago in, in Asimov's. And uh, I guess this was based on his experience going to the pyramids in Egypt and just being kind of disgusted by the American tourists who just, you know, in in Egypt to be a tour guide, you have to have like three PhDs in history. And so just all these American tourists are there and they're not paying any attention to the tour guide and they're all just talking among themselves about Hmm. American football. And so he kind of transposed that into a science fiction setting, which allows him to sort of exaggerate it for dramatic effect and put in kind of cool imaginative flourishes. And and it's based and, and and somebody on the on the message board I remember said about the story. They said I was always told in in English class that in a story the characters should change from the beginning hmm. to the end, and people a lesson should be learned. And that didn't you know what what did people learn in this story? What changed? And and Mike Resnick he actually gets involved you know on the message boards and he posted a thing and he's like not a damn thing. Hmm. <laughs> I always thought that that was great. That's an important lesson for writers also. Always listen to every single thing you learned in English <laughs> class and follow it to the letter. No, not really. Well, I mean, the thing with a, a lot of writing advice is that it's uh, it's good general advice, mm-hmm. you know, that there's a good reason why you shouldn't violate these things for the most part. But, of course, there are exceptions. And it, this makes new writers kind of uh, insufferable sometimes when they you know just have just come out of... Um, out of college or just come out of a workshop or something and think that they know everything and you know will tell you why are you sticking that tube down the guy's throat my mom always told me not to stick (laughs) down my throat and you're like look i'm trying to intubate this patient look i know what i'm doing all right that's a good (laughs) general rule not to stick stuff down your throat but in this case the rule doesn't apply okay right uh another story i really loved on escape pod was uh ted kosmatka's n words and this appeared in your um season change change. Mm -hmm. was that the first place this appeared yeah, it first appeared in Seeds of Change. 
Um, but but so in this story, the premise is that they've managed to clone Neanderthals from DNA samples that they've managed to obtain, and we sort of imagine Neanderthals being kind of dumb. Um, but in this story, the, uh, the the Neanderthals are essentially uh, superior to Homo sapiens in every possible way, and the reason you know they're smarter and stronger and and everything, and and the reason that they died out is because they're bigger and they require more calories, mm-hmm. and so when the the megafauna you know, had all died off. There just was weren't enough calories for them. But now they're they're kind of a, a super you know, a super race, and so they're um, subject to a lot of um, hostility. And it's just a really really cool, really powerful story. And I guess the the author has some sort of background in biomedical lab research mm-hmm. or something. Do you know? Exactly yeah, well, I, all I know is that he worked in some kind of lab, and like I mean, I know he has like some sort of uh, Neanderthal looking skull um, mold uh, in, in his uh, on his writing desk. Um, but uh, now he's working at Valve Entertain or Valve Software, so uh, that's that's in his past. But the science in the story, at least to me, felt very believable. Let's see, we're getting pretty short on time, so maybe I'll just yeah. quick, quickly mention. Uh, well, can I can I throw in a few yeah, in yeah. here? Uh, if I could just th- uh, throw in a few uh, that uh, I didn't ha- uh, have any affiliation with. Uh, one one story from Escape Pod I really liked was uh, "Instead of a Loving Heart" by Jeremiah Tolbert. Um, it's this like sort of Gonzo mad scientist story. Um, that uh, first appeared in um, uh, the All Star All Star Zeppelin Stories anthology uh, David Moles uh, put out a couple years ago. Actually, uh, we both have on our list uh, stories by Tim Pratt. You 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 uh, mentioned to Impossible Dreams to me, and then um, also one of my favorites uh, that was um, was that on Escape Pod. Um, one of my favorites was Cup and Table by Tim Pratt, which was on Podcastle, and uh, both of those are just like great stories. Um, um, actually, another another from podcast I really like, and actually anything you, anything you can listen to that's uh, read by Rajan Khanna, you know he uh, he did just a great job with the Annals of Ellen Ock by Jeffrey Ford, and uh, I mean actually anything you read by Jeffrey Ford is worth reading, you know anything you see by Jeff Ford is worth reading. So, um, and uh, and actually speaking of uh, of of authors to see in in the flesh read, uh, Jeff Ford is a really good reader himself. Yeah, so I mean, Impossible Dreams, uh, you know, won the Hugo Award. It's a great, great story about a guy who's a big movie buff, and he finds himself in sort of slipping into a video store from an alternate dimension where they have completely different movies. And I guess uh, Tim spent years kind of uh, thinking about what alternate movies mm-hmm. to to do, and and kind of had a list of all alternate movies based on real, you know, uh, th- things that almo- almost really happened, like like O.J. Simpson as the Terminator and. <laughs> You know things like that, and so all all those appear uh, in, in the in the story, and it's just it's really kind of just touching and satisfying, well plotted. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, you know that's 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 a story that really surprised me that it works as well as it does. Like I mean, I love that story. Uh, and then just the last one on my list is uh, Greg Van Eekhout's "Will You Be an Astronaut," which it, which is quite short, and it's 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 just an interesting uh, experiment in form because it's a story told in the form of a kind of um, documentary aimed at children to encourage them to grow up to fight a sort of weird alien protoplasmic things that are attacking Earth. Mm. So it's, and it's just, it's just really creepy because it's an adult trying to disguise the true terrifying situation from a child. Um, and it's, so it's just really creepy in a kind of understated way. Yeah, I really, I really like that story too. Uh, one of the things I meant to add when we were talking about N-words um, is, like, I, I like that narration, but I found like it was a little too slow for me. And one of the things I wanted to mention that I, I recently came to like is that like if you have an iPod or a, or a, if you have like a, a new pod, a new model iPod or, or an iPhone, there's a way you can actually speed up the narration. And it actually works surprisingly well. Like I thought that would just ruin an audiobook and you wouldn't really be able to listen to it. But, you know, so uh, there's a way to go in the settings that you can just make it. It's like, you know, there's there's a speed setting where you like you can have it read it slower. You can have it read it normal speed or you can have it read it faster. And if you if you make it read it faster, it actually just speeds it up and it it, uh, it adjusts the modulation so that it doesn't sound like, you know, Alvin and the Chipmunks or whatever. Um, like, as you would expect, uh, something uh, sort of fast forwarded a little bit to sound. And uh, I mean, I actually prefer to listen to stuff that way now, uh, for the most part. So well, it's funny when you're uh, when you do any sort of public speaking, people are always telling you like not to read too fast, just mm-hmm. read slower, read slower, read slower. Mm-hmm. But I've never listened to a podcast where it bothered me that the person was reading too fast. But I've mm-hmm. really been bothered by some where the person is reading too slow. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've I've certainly heard readings in person that were much too fast. You know, I don't know that I've heard podcasts that do it, but. 
you know, I was saying if you increase the speed of uh, of the playback, um, it doesn't uh, doesn't make it harder to understand or anything, and uh, that's fine. But I think that if the narrator tried to read it that fast, it probably would seem too fast. But the fact that they actually read it at this measured pace and then were sort of artificially speeding it up somehow, you know, mitigates that speed increase to the point where it's like, okay, well, that works. But if you had actually tried to read it this fast, it wouldn't have worked. Well, if we want to add any more material to this podcast, we're going to have to start talking way, way, way too fast. So (laughs) we're going to have to end it here. And that was our show. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. And be sure to join us next week when we'll interview Blake Charlton, a young writer whose love of fantasy literature helped him overcome dyslexia. He's now a medical student at Stanford, and his first novel, Spellright, about a dyslexic young wizard, will be out in March from Tor Books. See you then. The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is a production of Tor.com. For this episode's show notes, or to subscribe to this podcast, visit Tor.com and click on Podcasts. For more information about your hosts, visit JohnJosephAdams.com or DavidBarrCurrently.com. Music and voiceover produced by Deadspill9 Entertainment. If you've enjoyed this program, tell your friends. If you didn't enjoy it, tell no one. Thank you for listening.